Right, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Sandy. As usual, the people who need it most are not in class, eh? <laughs> Shows motivation, but never mind, we'll set off, we'll start off now. And um, what I will do in this lecture is wrap up whatever we have been doing for the first few days of the week, which involves um, bringing to you the coolest model. It's not an econometrics model, I will not um, give you a heart attack. The coolest model in town is um, not, well I don't have the bragging rights about that, that is of course Professor Fekete. Um, I'm just drawing the picture to the text that uh, the professor has made. And it struck, to, it struck to me that is indeed one of the finest models of disequilibrium I have ever seen, without one single note of derivations, to the chagrin of um, a lot of mathematicians. So all the atoms we have covered uh, in the past few days here, uh, those were necessary to arrive actually at the comprehension of this uh, model. And it is also necessary, I think, if you um, allow me to deviate a little bit from the lecture notes, I think it is necessary to sum it all up. The reflexes that one as an economist, an Austrian economist, should have are reflexes that are normal to, for instance, a mathematician. A mathematician has a reflex when he sees prices. Prices are in, in themselves meaningless and the professor has written um, in many cases, uh, at least two or three that I know of, of a lattice. Now, a lattice is, you know, you find them in front of every um, window in, 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 uh, on the rural side, but a lattice is a mathematical instrument. It's a reflex that one thinks of in combining a few sets. Now, I'm not a mathematician. I'm just explaining this in layman's words. Mm -hmm. And that lattice will give, in fact, objectivity to commodities and values. It's necessary to combine, in a set, those goods and services that you want to attach a price to through indirect exchange with another commodity of a constant fineness and variable weight, of course. Now, that kind of reflex is also induced with other uh, professions. The lawyer, for instance, has no problem in thinking about present goods and future goods. I think, personally, I'm not explaining here the position of the, uh, the official position of the new Austrian school. This is just my personal um, observation, when Mises talks about prices or about future goods and present goods, I think he got that idea from his school and that in his time I think he went in fact to law school to get an economic or a political economy education. Odd, you would say, well, in fact, the law school at that time was the faculty of economics. It later on uh, split. I may, I may be wrong. I didn't do much research on this. Now, what is the reflex of, of a lawyer? Well, to, to any lawyer, really, a present good is a tangible good. It's here and now. Gold coin, obviously, is a tangible good. And there are several degrees of ownership. Of course, ownership. I mean, what are so, there are so many court cases about ownership that it has been developed over hundreds, if not thousands, of years. What is ownership? 
and different degrees and layers of ownership. You have ownership, and then you have possession. <coughs> and one step further, you have a custodian holder. To a lawyer, that is a reflex. He immediately knows what that is. Even another um, profession in human sciences, as an accountant, for instance, he would immediately have the reflex to think stocks and flows. There's no problem for him. A balance sheet is a picture of stocks. And an income and expense sheet reflects all the flows. Now once a year, once a quarter, once a month, whatever time period you want to stick to this, he takes a picture of the flows and sticks that with the stocks. And then he goes on with the flow. So there's a reflex that you have to develop. As an economist, this I believe is the, well, if you forgive me the expression, it's the queen of human sciences because everything comes together. Accountancy comes there. Law comes there. Think of it, it all comes into economy. That's why I would call it the queen of the human sciences. You have to be, well, not a specialist in every field, but you have to be, you have to have all those reflexes. We had Sandeep, Rudy, the professor, speak about arbitrage. We spoke about um, stocks and flows. We, we, we spoke about another reflex, in, that an economist should have, and that is the reflex of, well, in connection with stocks and flows, that you would have with um, net present values. If interest goes up, net present value goes down and other way up. That, but, okay, I'm not here to explain algebra. That is, um, I'm not even qualified to teach algebra. <laughs> I'll be the last person. Um, but those reflexes are important. And we've covered all that, and that's important to understand the working of um, a disequilibrium model. We've covered, for instance, one of the most important um, reflexes that you don't look at a price. Price is meaningless. If I, say, if I tell you five, what does that mean? Five and four gives you a spread. That's a reflex as an economist. Spread, ding dong, it should click. Now, mainstream economists have another reflex which they have cultivated uh, in the supply and demand um, curves and um, it, it's, it's a, a mystery to me um, they have not as yet developed the sense that this is not going anywhere but in, it, it, it is um, a, a reflex they have developed the Austrian school um, has other reflexes What is, well, spreads are the guiding star because, I mean, you can have a spread, but you're not trying to run a loss. Buying at five and selling at four, obviously. Human action is purposeful. That's the definition of human action. Well, you can run on purpose an airplane into the ground, yes. You can run on purpose an air, um, your business um, in, into receivership, obviously. But, I mean, we're talking about a normal case. One of the most important tools, I think, is arbitrage. And we've covered that. I think, Rudy, was it Rudy that covered horizontal, or was it Keith? Uh, yes, it was Keith. Horizontal and vertical arbitrage, that has been explained. Uh, there is also bid-ask arbitrage, and I think that may have been underestimated a little bit, because that comes in into the yield curve. And it is, an, it is something that not, not many people would immediately grasp. 
What's another thing that's important in science, and that has also been part of the theme this week, is in science you need strong opinion. Now we've seen that, haven't we? It has come up this week regularly, if not daily. But think about it, strong opinion is what you need in, in science. Uh, I mean, what if Mises didn't have strong opinion? We would not be sitting here. If Mises had a, a weak opinion, you know, we, we would be not, well, we would not even have the advantage of reading his book. Even better, what if Karl Menger didn't have a strong opinion? He would not have his insights. He would not have been able to fight the classical school with tooth and, what is the expression? Tooth and nail. So strong opinion, sometimes expressed on television, in books, in writings, is necessary. It is not that we antagonize anyone, especially not the Mises Institute, on purpose, I would say. It just happens that, that um, well, the word Hegelian dialectic has fallen here. Um, and, I, and I'm not fond of Hegel. He gives me a headache. But that's maybe personal. Um, but Hegelian dialectic, I do understand. And in, in, in that sense, uh, if I can use that expression, Mises, Menger are just a step. From there on, it advances. Because Mises and Menger had something, what also is a word in Austrian economics, a bit of radical ignorance. It's there, but you have to find it, and you don't know. You don't know the context. Now, we have the advantage of the insights of both of them, so we can advance. And it is here that we have to depart, in fact, from Mises, even in a major way. Some will think tough, but okay, I don't think tough. It's normal. I think, um, well, we can't speak for Mises, he's not here, but I think a normal person would find it strange if you stick to old dogmas. Um, it, it, I'm, I'm pretty sure in the future, we one would look at what we do here and what the, the work of the professor has done here and say, okay, we advance. We advance from the professor, Professor Fekete's work. I think it will be a while before that happens because this uh, is quite a leap that we have made, I think, from uh, classical um, economy and as well the Austrian economist. The, it will be a while before somebody betters, personally, I think, on, on the professor's work. I'm not saying this because you're here. Um, I'm, I'm saying this because it, I think it is just true. Um, and we all know that, um, well, maybe we are smart enough to better the work and, and we, nobody would have a problem with that. In your notes on this lecture, one would find that um, The interest coming up as a process or the formation of interest is, a, is the result of a process of human action. You will find there that um, Mises had a particular view which is a hereditary view that he, he also inherited a view that, that was old. In fact, it was so old that it wasn't even to be ascribed to Aristotle. It came from old Vedic texts. Where, I mean, if, if the word interest and usury comes up already across the other side of the globe, thousands of years ago, then that should tell you something. It should tell you it is a universal and old I'm not going to say it's a problem, it is an issue. I don't read uh, Sanskrit, 
and I've lost all my uh, Greek knowledge. So I will not attempt to go and dig into Aristotle's uh, old texts. It's, I mean, they have been translated adequately, I think. It is, of course, um, also Aristotle's main contribution to the West, or let's call it the Judeo-Christian society, culture, that we live in here. And it's not, it's not just a little contribution. The Western Roman Empire collapsed. It was a catastrophe one could not imagine. A thousand years had to pass before there was any light, any intellectual development of, of, of some, well, not some form, but of significance. It, it, well, yeah, from 472 until, until uh, the Renaissance. That's a thousand years. Can you imagine? In the meantime, in those thousand years and after 472, the, I mean, we have um, our Lebanese professor in the room, but you can check with him. I'm not making this up. Whilst the people here were still fighting with knives and pitchforks after the collapse of the Roman Empire, about who is the king. <laughs> Islamist culture was making clock, clocks, water-driven clocks, timepieces. In Spain, they had set up hospitals and, and a university even. Imagine, I mean, what the contrast. <clears throat> so it is Aristotle and over, of course, um, St. Thomas of Aquinas, who introduced Aristotle's work back into the West. Luckily, he did. We wouldn't be here without him. At least not in this form. Von Mises had his theory of interest partially from what was left over. The Aristotle's view that interest was um, unjust is, is should be, I mean, it's, it's not just black and white. Aristotle's view said, well, okay, gold does not beget gold, cattle does, Therefore, anything that you ask more is, is, is over the top, is unjust. It shows that it is a justice problem, not necessarily an economic problem, because he also did recognize a few cases where it was. And even the Arab world, here's an interesting other fact, the Arab world knows usually under the name of riba. And the Hebrew or the Jewish culture knows that as ribit. In Arab culture, riba does not apply to bills. Now that should tell you something. Why doesn't it apply to bills? Well, that's, that's commerce, not interest. Yet the mechanism behind it is the same. It should tell us two things. One, that bills were used in the Middle East. So it's not a local affair from the southern French markets or the Italian markets, bills are an instrument of international trade. And why doesn't riba of you or usury come up there? Well, maybe that's a cultural thing, maybe that's only because the people that are, and, and this, is, this is, well, more for somebody who's a cultural anthropologist, he could or she huh, could, an could answer that better than I could. Um, but I think if I look at the Jewish uh, communities, they did not charge interest amongst themselves. That was a sin. But against others, that's fine. Therefore, this international trade was exempted. That is my take on it.
That must have been pretty confusing. And Mises did, um, in his theory of interest, he just looked as a student of Wixell, Knut Wixell, uh, he looked at his um, mentor who came up himself with the concept of a natural rate of interest. They knew it was there. And I think um, I did read one chapter on interest in uh, human action. I think, I believe that, that Mises does call this um, a um, market phenomenon. And I think he also did not stand still with the verbiage, with the, the word he used on, 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 as a market. Um, he did play with the idea of a natural rate of interest. It all became, uh, in his idea, originary interest rate. Uh, he modified that to a personal interest rate to you and to anybody else. And from his legal input, he derived at present good and future good. And perhaps he was a bit obfuscated by that. Um, uh, he's not here, we cannot uh, put words in his mouth, so I will refrain from that. I'm just saying that that, that might have been a reason. Uh, and indeed, he did average that, and you know, what is the exception? Well, there are millions of peoples, therefore there are, there's a multiplicity of loans, and there's a multiplicity of interest rates. So if you average that, well then we get an average rate of interest. Simple solution for him, and he did not look um, much further. He may, he might have, I don't know. If, if you look at his um, theory of interest, he makes a few interesting observations, namely the propensity to save is inverse to the rate of interest. This is a correct reflex. The propensity to save diminishes as interest rates rise. And of course, also the other way round. And you can actually push that to zero or infinity, but that would be the subject of the next, um, of the next lecture. It's also interesting that, if I have to conclude on, on, on Mises' um, points of view, that there is no differentiation between short-term and long-term. The short-term, we would say, fine, those rates are bill rates. And we know that they are related to consumption. <laughs> 